important to many of us who have uh, young children or children getting ready to transition into adult care. Uh, Dr. Bob Eisenman is going to be talking to us about transitioning from pediatric to adult care. Dr. Eisenman is a professor of pediatrics at McMaster University, chief of pediatric gastroenterology and nutrition, and the director of ambulatory service at McMaster Children's Hospital. He attended Harvard, Université de Montréal, and McMaster Universities. Dr. Eisenman is past president of the Canadian Pediatric Society, a past member of the Governing Council of the North American Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition, and currently is the president of the Healthy Generations Foundation. Please help me welcome Dr. Eisenman. And how do I advance the slides? Okay, I'll just I'll see what happens. Okay, there we go. Okay, uh, get everybody here. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, I'm delighted. I hope uh, we have a little bit of fun with this uh, because if you're dealing with adolescents, if it's not fun, they're out of here. And uh, I was uh, mindful that, to tell you that apparently we're okay because it's 1-1 one, one, Leafs. Canadian. So, uh, so uh, the reason that this is a topic of some interest is that um, transition it can be a very turbulent and dangerous time for young people. In Canada, most uh, care of uh, kids with inflammatory bowel disease is done by uh, pediatric services, but that has to end at about 18. And this corresponds with time in people's life that uh, you might remember as being fairly intense, uh, the love of internal and social turmoil, and people are actually trying to find themselves, figure out who they are, and they're all looking to their friends uh, for that. So peers are terribly important. Um, one of the things we know about kids, uh, if not adults, is that people mature at different rates. And uh, there's some people, and there's some adolescents, and I know many who are terrific at these things, but uh, not all of adolescents are great at planning, anticipation, organization, and self-discipline. So I have a 20-year-old at this time, and uh, you know, we uh, regular phone calls of what just went wrong because of a deficit of any one of those four uh, aspects. Uh, so one of the things we're learning about uh, adolescents comes from the new neurobiology, uh, and we're learning more and more about uh, people's brains. And um, this uh, is probably pink because it, girls, I think, have a lot more of this uh, in adolescence than this. And that has to do with executive functions, thinking, planning, organizing, problem solving, uh, and so forth. Um, now, this is another in the adolescent brain. So there's a lot, there's a rebellion center. There's a little tiny thing here called the judgment plan. Uh, love for parents, fights with hate for parents. Uh, Self-image, slamming and punching reflex. Uh, and I've got the holes in my wall to prove it. Uh, and body language as well. So the adolescent brain actually is structured somewhat differently than the mature brain. And the neurobiology suggests that this uh, goes on till possibly early 20s, mid 20s. So people aren't, well, we're all let's put it that way. Uh, now, uh, one of the most important things about uh, actually following John Marshall, we didn't compare our notes, this is a very, very good time to have inflammatory bowel disease because there's such effective treatments. But the most important thing about them is you've got to take them. They really don't work if you don't take them. Standing close to the treatment generally doesn't work very well. You actually have to take the treatment. Uh, and the impact of poor adherence is really quite dramatic. So if there's good adherence, that's the word we use for people taking the medication as they're supposed to, uh, the outcome, good outcomes are three times higher, and there's a 26% reduction in poor treatment outcome. Now, this is stated positively. You can do the math on the negative aspects of, uh, of uh, 
for endurance. And we know that everybody is uh, terrible at this. Um, certainly the average uh, person, the average population, uh, endurance is about 60 to 80 percent for stuff like 10 days of penicillin for a strep throat. If you start talking about conditions uh, that you have to take medication day in, day out, it drops to 30 to 40 percent. And I can tell you uh, that physicians' families are no better <coughs> from anybody else. So what are the patterns of adherence in adolescents? Uh, not great. Asthma, maybe half HIV, which is life-threatening. They may take about half the medication they're supposed to. Uh, liver transplants, kidney transplants. In diabetes, 25% of the kids are missing injections. 81% are not following a diet, and 29% aren't measuring their blood sugar. And these are the three basic tenets of good diabetes, diabetic management. Um, so what happens in the transition as, as teens transition to adult care? Well, I, I don't think it gets any better. And uh, the, the folks that look at this find that the common denominator for not everybody but too much is not adherence with medication missed appointments, and an incomplete understanding of the role of the medication and the importance of keeping appointments. I'll reference you back to the picture of the adolescent brain as to what's important in life. Uh, so how does this experience this means when the pediatric patient at 17 or 18 transitions to an adult care provider? Well, surveys have suggested that the uh, adolescent experience they don't know how to make an appointment. Actually, they've often been with a parent who's actually done most of the arranging. And, uh, you know, if they get an appointment, they actually have competing interests and they may not show up for the appointment. And they, when they go, they may not like the practitioner. And, and liking the practitioner turns out to be terribly important. If you go back to my character of the brain, the love was very, very prominent in everything else. What about parents? How do they transition? Well, the uh, parents often feel like suddenly they've been cut out. They're made to sit in the waiting room. Uh, they've often been the person who's been there and kind of kept track of what's going on. And they feel like, oh my God, my child uh, doesn't, isn't going to be able to tell the whole story. What's going to happen? Um, and the parents are not really sure based on you know their day-to-day -day interaction that the patients can really uh, assert themselves. And certainly, uh, you know, teenagers may go in and come out. The parents say, so what happened? And if it's a guy, they get a shrug. And if they get a girl, well, they get something else. Uh, how do they experience it? Well, these are the negative experiences. I mean, I love adolescents. I think they're very uh, appealing. And it's a very exciting part of time. But, uh, our practitioners experience them as frustrations. They don't know very much. They don't know the answers to the questions. They don't know what their disease is. They don't know where it is. They don't know when they started their medicine. And they sometimes seem like they're really not that interested in what's going on in the consulting room. And certainly they may be disorganized. So NASBGAM, which is the pediatric GI organization, in fact, tried to look at some positives of what happens when adolescent patients go to see adult practitioners. And first of all, it's a normal stage of development. Regardless of whether it's rocky or not, this is, you got to, the teenagers have to accomplish this in all the spheres of life. And this does promote uh, independent behavior and a degree of self-reliance. Uh, and with that comes improved compliance or adherence. Um, now, what the pediatricians are really either not very good at or not very comfortable uh, we've had a few of our patients under 18 getting pregnant, not in the clinic, but while the kids are under our care. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it really is kind of bamboozling uh, for, a, for a simple pediatrician. Uh, we, we don't really worry too much about cancer because our view is we're going to see the kids mostly starting at 12. We're going to transition them at 18. So we've got to remember that they've got 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years of life and that uh, Cancer surveillance is very important. Uh, and then there are all the issues that really young adults are terribly concerned about, which is, can I 
get a job, can I hold a job, um, can I compete? It's a very competitive environment these days, and it takes guts to compete, literally. And what about insurance? Am I going to run out of my insurance? Or what, uh, if I switch jobs, will the insurance follow and so forth? So one of the patterns uh, that I think we've got to say, so what is the issue here? And basically, you may or may not be aware if you're an adult audience, that most of IBD care in Canada is provided in specialized university-associated health science centers. And these centers have uh, interdisciplinary teams. In other words, the teams have doctors, nurses, social workers, child life workers. Uh, and it's kind of a mystery to pediatricians why none of these, or very few of these folks, are, are can be found in adult clinics. Uh, I, I don't know the answer. I suspect because if you don't attend to these issues, people do so badly that everybody comes to the same conclusion. You're going to look after kids well, you need those interdisciplinary teams. Adults, it's more survival of the fittest. Uh, and except in some university clinics, much of adult care is delivered by individual practitioners practicing in office settings with the sole support of an office secretary or a nurse. And there's some good aspects of that, but there's also some problems. So one of the good aspects of that kind of care is that you get your doctor and your doctor gets to know you and they build up a relationship. Whereas in the university settings, it's often a team and you may see a different person at different times. Um, the adult, for the most part, are, there's a nurse, whereas the model in pediatrics is a nurse practitioner who's often the single point of contact. So uh, if someone gets sick, they phone up and there's one person who they know who's going to be the nurse practitioner, and that nurse practitioner is available working uh, during the work week uh, and might relate to the different jobs. Uh, the other thing is that in emergencies, uh, the pediatric services tend to have a better developed emergency system of who you're going to call. You're going to call the, the GI service, uh, whereas in adults who are in the community, Often the care is we'll go to your emergency department. And I, I, I run, uh, for the last couple of years, I've run the emergency department here. And with all due respect, I would say that emergency departments are a bit like Casino Niagara. Sometimes you hit the jackpot and you get great care. Sometimes you get pretty average care. And sometimes you don't know what kind of, what you're getting. And it's very hard as an administrator of an emergency department to guarantee that people really get coordinated care that addresses their problems. Uh, in a very efficient fashion. Um, lastly, and I didn't put it at the bottom, but adult care tends, the model tends to be acute care. In other words, uh, you're, I'm your doctor, come in and see me if you get sick. Whereas the pediatric model tends to be, we'll see you every three or four months. And there's some aspects of that that change the whole dynamic of what that visit's about. Uh, and I will, I'm going to go back up to that because I didn't have a slide to address it. But the difference between seeing people for health maintenance is you see them at their best, you see them when they're well, you see them when they're not worried, and you see them when they're less anxious. And what that means is you can talk to them about what's important about you, what's important about your life, and also there's the develop, ability to develop a relationship. Also, these are positive interactions rather than oh my God, you're having some bleeding, I think we ought to do a colonoscopy on you. Now, I don't know that it's entirely true, and I don't want to mischaracterize my adult uh, colleagues and experience, but if you had a lab rat, and the lab rat went into the doctor's office, and the lab rat, uh, in the answer to the question, I said, I'm having bloody poop. And every time the lab rat did that, somebody stuck something up the lab rat's backside, uh, it would take the lab rat very few visits to decide that they're not going to say what's really going on. Uh, and uh, we're closer to uh, the animal kingdom in this respect than we look here to admit. So I want to reinforce what Dr. Marshall said, which is in 2014, IBD treatments work. It is really quite amazing the range of stuff we have and how well it works. But for the treatments to work, patients have to take the treatment. And they have to kind of do it more or less the way it's suggested. So what aspects 
uh, that the urine is called adherence, taking the medicine the way you're supposed to. So the interesting thing about this, this has been studied, and uh, here are the five aspects that are associated with people who actually take the medicine the way they're supposed to. One is the patient actually understands the disease process and the role the medication uh, takes in treatment. And we all do a good job and a lot of teaching aids around that stuff. The second one is the patient likes the physician or care provider. Now, what does that have to do with the price of AIDS? I mean, really, that it actually people will do things that they like the doctor, uh, and they will not do things if they dislike the, the doctor or the nurse. Third one is the physician office is, is accessible. Now, what, what does that have to do with anything? Why should that matter? Well, all of us are a little bit childish at times, and particularly when we're sick. And if we can get a, an excuse, this is my own explanation, of why we don't take the medicine or we don't take the treatment, like I couldn't get through to the doctor's office. No one returned my calls. Uh, there was no call to pharmacy. There's only a fine segment of the population that will actually continue to take the medicine in spite of what are seen as obstacles. Certainly, Dr. Marshall said, once a day treatment is easier to take than three times a day or complex regimens, so if the medication is convenient. And the last one is, and this is really kind of basic, but people take medicine if they know they've got an upcoming appointment because they know what's going to happen is the doctor's going to say, and are you taking a medication? And Canadians, for the most part, are, they really are very truthful. Now, if they don't have to say to anybody whether they're taking medication or not, they fill the prescription. But if they know they've got one coming up and they're going to be asked a question, they tend to take the medication. And so what you end up with is this conclusion that the challenge of transition is that for many patients, the issues are mostly emotional and only partially logical. Now, this comes as a huge surprise to the medical students I teach. And over the years, I've tried to explain this to them. And the way I finally figured it out is to say, when you go to the med medical school, you leave the human race. And what I mean by that is much of adult life is emotional and not logical. And people who go to medical school buy into this thing that says people do things for logical, rational reasons. And that is only true for some people some of the time. So this means that transition has to address the emotional as well as the logical issues. And what that means is You've got to start early, and you've got to train, give people a chance to practice. So you begin transition early in pediatric care, and we do this with our visits where right from the word go, we want the patient to fill in the questionnaire as to what's my illness, when did I get it, where is it, and what's my medication by name. And we practice that three or four times a year so that by the time they're 18, they know the answers to those questions. We try to treat the patients as responsible adults. And that's because adolescents, and some of us are still adolescents, will try to, and think of the person you're married to, will try and put the blame on anybody else. So if they get sick, it's because you didn't refill my, my prescription. You didn't put the medication out. You didn't buy the stuff at the store I'm supposed to eat. And when we bring the kids into clinic, we look them straight in the eye, and we try and hold them accountable for what's going on and that is good for their growth. Um, it's very important when, you, when you're transitioning a kid to an adult clinic that we actually make the appointment, and then uh, Usha, who you'll meet, will actually come up to the clinic so people are meeting a person. There's only a small number of people who will go off to them, uh, either meet a doctor, a lawyer, uh, or a dentist based on name alone. They want to know who they me because it's a personal experience, and if you can do it, what you do is you have someone who is uh, an intermediary who makes bridges the gap, and uh, lastly, for our kids, we really do recommend that they go to uh, a transition clinic or a vulnerable patient clinic, and that means for about 18 to 23 until they've more mature and more responsible going to a multidisciplinary clinic in a university health center 
has the advantage of addressing some of these things. Now, I can, I'm willing to discuss that, and there are many fine individual practitioners. It's not the fault of the practitioners. It's really the way teenagers are put together. So, are there ways in which adult clinics can foster adherence? So, does the young patient have a single identified clinician? That's very important. Is the clinic easy to access to answer questions and new prescriptions for emergency care to make appointments? Are the health maintenance appointments or is the patient only calls when they get sick? Is there a medical record that monitors prescription refills, immunization, and minutes appointments? Now, there's some interesting answers to that, which is we're actually evolving some different models. And some of them are in the academic health science centers. Some of them are in outside infusion clinics in which uh, other people, pharmacists, nurses, are taking on some of these functions that are maybe not so apparent in the adult clinics. Pediatric clinics, we feel that most clinics in the country have regularly scheduled health maintenance appointments, a nurse coordinator, team care, after hours and weekend emergency, and oh yeah, I said it again because I think it's important, uh, the maintenance appointments. The specialty clinic in at McMaster has single physician, same building, same medical record, nurse practitioner is a single point of contact, dedicated psychiatric resource, teams meet nurse practitioner at last pediatric appointment, nurse appointment, if they don't show up, there's a follow-up, and then lastly, there's a did it work appointment back in pediatrics. In other words, they, we bring them back one time, ask they've met the adult doc, and said, is this going to work for you? And then we shake their hand, and we give them a graduation certificate. And it doesn't always work, but we're just pulling together to try and increase the chances. So I'm going to put a pitch, because I know I've got the air of Crohn's and colitis here. And I don't know if you've watched what's happening in cancer therapy, but in adult cancer patients face many of the same challenges that adult Crohn's and colitis patients. In response, adult oncology services develop patient navigators, and they've institutionalized the role of an individual person who's there for you. As IBD treatments get more complex and more effective, I'd ask, is it time for patient navigators for other adult patient groups? So there are some tools. I'm going to just close by flashing these for you. So a sick kids has developed my IBD, which is an online medical diary, uh, which can, people can track their illness and medications and so forth. That's free. Uh, um, NASH began, which is the Pediatric GI organization in North America has the IBDU, IBDUniversity.org. And uh, Get Gutsy, which is Crohn's Splice Canada, has uh, its own website and apps. And uh, lastly, we have our own website, which is uh, called Your Key to IBD at Mad Kids for the patients who are still part of our program. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And, uh, I Please have been part of this program.